I'm Mike Dilger, a passionate traveller and nature fanatic. Wow, look! I've come to the Philippines because I've heard this country is one of the most biodiverse places on our planet. I'm going off the beaten track to meet some inspirational Filipino people who are protecting that biodiversity and shaping the future of these islands. And my fellow BBC presenter Rico Hizon will share some of the wonders of the country he grew up in. This is where heaven and earth come together. Over two weeks, we'll travel from the coast in the west to the interior of the north. Along the way, we'll delve deep into the Philippines' cultural heritage to find out more about this island nation. That is just gorgeous. I've only just arrived and this place has already blown me away. Pristine tropical forest perched on top of jagged limestone. And below the water, rich coral reefs teeming in life. This is my first time in the Philippines. And to say the least, I'm very excited about the journey that I'm about to take. The Philippines is made up of over 7,000 tropical islands. And I'm starting my adventure 600 kilometers southwest of Manila in Puerto Princesa, the capital of the island of Palawan. To give me some local insight, I'm meeting my BBC colleague Rico Hizon, who's taken time out of the newsroom to give me a quick language lesson. Rico, whenever I visit a new country, like in my case, the Philippines, yes. I always like to try and learn the languages to kind of open doors and win hearts and minds. It's a real polyglot here, isn't it? Well, you must remember that there are more than 100 languages and dialects here in the Philippines. The national language in the Philippines is Filipino. And its origins are Spanish, English, and one of our native dialects called Tagalog. But 93% of the population either speak or understand the English language. So I can get by in English, but I would much rather just my please and thank you yes. in Tagalog. So please. Please is pakiusap. Pakiusap. Thank you is maraming salamat. Maraming salamat. Yes. And if you want to tell the people that you love them, Mahal kita. Yeah. That's the one I will yeah. remember. <laughs> Mahal kita. That's nice, that yes. is. Even the name of the country is fascinating. It's spelt with a PH, yes. but I've heard the people who are called Filipinos spelt with an F. I've also heard Pilipinas. Mm -hmm. What's going on? Are you getting confused, Mike? <laughs> Just slightly. <laughs> well, because the Philippines was ruled by the Spanish uh, for more than 300 years, and they named the country after their head of state, and his name was King Felipe II, spelled with an F. However, the natives couldn't really pronounce the F, yes. so they called the country initially Pilipinas. And then uh, you had the Americans come in. They couldn't also spell Felipe with an F, so they converted it into PH. Hence, that's why we're now called the Philippines. Rico, yes. marami salamat po. Mike, walang anuman. And that means? My pleasure. Having grasped some basic Filipino, Rico has pointed me in the direction of a popular diversity hotspot. Sitting on the coastline is the Puerto Princesa Subterranean River. This river runs for eight kilometers underground, emerging into the sea just here, making it an underground estuary. This is one of very few in the whole world. So my bet is there's going to be some pretty exciting wildlife inside. Mm -hmm. 
just inside the cave, we're confronted with enormous stalactites and stalagmites, reaching around six metres in height. While tourists must stay in their boat, I've been given permission to go ashore and look for wildlife. Check out this tarantula. This is really exciting. My first ever obligate troglobite. Now, that's a fancy term. Let me explain. Troglobite, it's a cave dweller. The obligate ones are the really interesting ones. They can only exist in pitch darkness. This would not survive in the outside world. I'm about one kilometre deep inside this cave, and with no natural light, many cave creatures have remarkable adaptations to the dark. Oh, look at that. Look at the size of this centipede. You spend millions of years living in a place like this. You evolve differently. Look at the length of its antennae. This is a predator that feels its way around. Because this underground river flows directly into the sea, fresh water, salt water, and cave ecosystems merge together, creating plenty of opportunities for life to flourish. And the diversity outside the cavern is just as impressive. Within minutes, there are water monitor lizards which can grow to two meters. Long-tail macaques playing in the trees. And then, by a very noisy outhouse. Ah, it's a species I've dreamt of seeing on this trip. Right by the generator. Palawan peacock pheasant. One of the most beautiful birds in the Philippines and one I've wanted to see all my life. The plumage is iridescent. It's got a long tail with gorgeous eye spots. They can only be found here on this island. These are so rare now. They're hunting for their feathers and also for meat. That is absolutely beautiful. <laughs> Ever since I was invited to the Philippines, there was one bird, just one, I wanted to see. That. What a start to our journey. Modern pressures on the Palawan landscape are putting many areas here under threat. Next, I'm traveling two hours into the rainforest to meet a remarkable member of the indigenous Batak tribe. A traditional way to travel to the village. Magando Maga. The Batak people are thought to have been some of the first settlers in the Philippines around 50,000 years ago. They now live in an area known as Cleopatra's Needle, relying on subsistence fishing and farming for survival. Dampot is a family man and member of the Batak, and as well as fishing, he harvests a tree called Almasiga for its special resin. Used traditionally for starting fires and repelling mosquitoes, there's now a modern commercial use for the resin. Ito yung almasiga, maraming ginagamitan, kagaya ng mga plastic, langgana, sako, galon, at saka barnis, pintura, yun ang ginagamit nito. Almasiga, yun ang unang kabuhayan namin dito. Kung hindi kami makaalmasiga, hindi kami makakain ng kanin. Yun ang ginagawa namin. Yung 
pagkukuhaan ito talagang malayo. Kalating araw ang paglalakad, limang oras yung lakad papunta doon sa bundok, kukuha ka lang ng, ng almasiga. Nakukuha namin sa loob ng tatlong araw, isang sako na lang. It, 800 pesos, 3 days, 50 kilos. $16 for 3 days work. That is hard work. It's just enough for Dampot's family to live on. But people outside of the tribe are coming in and taking the resin using unsustainable methods. And the resin is in danger of running out. So the Batak have taken things into their hands and begun their own conservation measures. They've planted 8,000 Almasiga seedlings to help repopulate the forest. And Dampot has asked me to help. It was good? Yeah, yeah, okay. In 20 years' time, maybe Dampot's yeah. children or his grandchildren will be able to use this to collect the sap and will keep this wonderful Batak tribe going strong. Having seen how the land can be cared for, I want to see how local produce is being used by the wider community. Rico is taking me to a new and enterprising all-female Palawan business. Mike, look at this. Beer, no beer. I don't know which way I'm going. <laughs> I'm joining you. <laughs> The Palawenyo Brewery is the first female-run craft brewery in the Philippines. And brewmaster Aya Javier is using local ingredients to flavor her ale. Uh, for this particular beer, we use our local honey. Are most of your ingredients locally sourced? We do utilize most of the local ingredients for the spices that we grow here in Palawan, mm -hmm. which is like honey, mango, and uh, some coconuts. It makes it more Palawan. Aya's inspiration for the craft beer came from much further afield. Why did you get into this? So I was living in San Diego, California, mm -hmm. when the craft beer industry boomed there. I fell in love, just totally head over heels. I was thinking, man, Filipinos, you know, we love our beers. But 750 different styles of beer in the world. In the Philippines, we only know of one beer, which is our Spanish beer. So I went back home, I bought a home brewing kit and started brewing. It's been a lovely journey. I won't replace it with anything else. These craft ales are now proving popular with locals and tourists alike. And so now Aya has plans to take the taste of Palawan to the world. So Aya, you have a thriving business here. What are your plans going forward for your business? Yeah, we're planning on uh, putting up a brewery in America. And uh, we're also thinking of uh, exporting to our Asian countries. I think you should try Britain too. You have a willing purchaser right here. <laughs> it's very refreshing, beautiful taste. And the fact it's made and brewed on the premises makes it even better. Cheers. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Cheers, guys. Here on the island of Palawan, tourism is one of the fastest growing business sectors, and ecotourism is becoming an important part of that. As sun sets at Awahig, close to the island's capital, people come to drift through the darkness in search of a species I've heard a lot about. The banks of this estuary are lined with mangrove which is the perfect home for an enlightening insect, the firefly. By using a soft red light, you can mimic a very large male firefly. Wow! and get a pulsing response from hundreds of others, as I'm finding out. <laughs> Look at this! Wow! The 
They're not flies at all. They're actually beetles. The really brightest lights are mostly the males. They try and be brighter than the male next to them. So we often see pulses of light as they all synchronise their lights together, trying to be the brightest shining star. And the one that does that will be the one that gets the female. This nighttime spectacle is now a popular tourist attraction and it's helping to protect this precious coastal habitat. In huge areas of the tropics and subtropics, mangroves are being cut down, clearing the way for fisheries and construction. But because the fireflies here are attracting paying tourists, this mangrove is, thank goodness, being left alone for the wildlife to flourish. There's one right there. <laughs> one. Oh, it's flown off. Over the past few days, it's been heartening to see how some people here in the Philippines are working hard to save their natural assets. But not all species are benefiting just yet. I've been invited to join a local conservation group to find out more about their challenge. Palawan is a stronghold for a huge array of endemic species, with many hanging on as their pristine forest in which they live has been cut down. But there is one species that's become an icon for this area, the Philippine cockatoo. My big passion is wild birds, so it really hurts to know that this species is critically endangered. There are thought to be less than a 1,000 left in the wild. Anna Agusho, a conservationist from the Katala Foundation, has given us a tip-off. There are cockatoos sheltering in a nearby village. Fabulous. There's two or three here. Right in the middle of this community, cockerels calling, music blaring, and one of the Philippines' rarest birds right in front of us. So, Anna, my understanding is the Philippine cockatoo was once right across the Philippines. Why is it so rare now? Yes, because of three main threats. The first one is illegal poaching, poaching for pet trade. Second is uh, habitat destruction. And then the third one is uh, persecution. It's amazing there are any left. Almost every Philippine cockatoo nest is systematically raided each year for the global pet trade. The only safe haven in the country for the cockatoos is where we're going next, Rasa Island, just off the coast of Palawan. And I've been granted special access. The cockatoos nest here in spring. Oh, what a view. But right now, Anna and her team are examining the nest holes to see if they're safe for the next clutch. That is amazing. Lucid, one of the wardens, is going to check out one of the nest holes of the cockatoo. And he's just climbed up a liana. He's now about 10 metres above the ground. Astonishing. He measures the, the depth of the nest chamber. So the deeper the hole is, uh, it's better for the cockatoos. It's, yeah, it's safer from predators, like right. monitor lizards, snakes, rats, and also people. Poachers. Poachers. Indeed. At 2.7 metres deep, this nest should be safe from illegal poachers. And Lucy, the warden, ought to know, as I discovered. Ang ginagawa ako, nagaakyat ng mga ibon tapos binibinta. Magkakuha ako bawat ina kay sa isang araw, walo. Singkwinta bawat piraso. So what was the moment that you changed from being a poacher to somebody who looks after the birds? Ano ko ito noong 2006 na ano na protektahan sila. Ang ibon na buhay sa wild dapat hindi pakialaman. And when you see the birds flying and nesting, how do you feel? Masayang masaya kasi kung hindi namin talaga naprotektahan, wala nang makita yung mga kinaapu-apuhan namin. Pagpasok ko sa warden, hindi ako marunong sumulat, hindi rin ako masahuran. 
kung walang accomplishment report na ngayon natuto ako magsulat kaya ikinakarangal ko at nagpapasalamat ako masayang masaya ako talaga sa trabaho na to well i think the project is lucky to have you working for them congratulations keep up the good work This conservation program is successfully helping both birds and the local people. Many poachers have swapped sides and become wardens like Lucid. Thanks to them, this island now has a growing population of Philippine cockatoos, which in turn should attract tourists and more conservation investment in the future. Make no mistake, I'll be really sad to leave Palawan, but I'm excited about the next leg of my tropical journey through the Philippines. Bring on the next island. 300 kilometers southwest of Manila is Coron Island. It's encircled with coral reefs and fringed with enormous jagged cliffs. These rock structures are awe-inspiring. It's like nature's greatest cathedral. And over 95% of it looks like this. It's barely habitable. The whole island is composed of cast limestone, which was laid down 200 million years ago. And when rain falls, it absorbs atmospheric carbon dioxide and dissolves away the rock at different rates, creating these beautiful, jagged structures. If I were to go on land, I bet I'd find caves, sinkholes, perfect places for nature to hide away. It creates so many wonderful microhabitats or niches. That's why it's such a rich place for nature. This intricate coastline also provides many homes for life to proliferate beneath the waves, making it one of the best snorkeling locations in the world. The sea is as warm as bath water, and the visibility is astonishing. Look at all the coal behind me. Can't wait to get in. The Philippines is part of what's known as the Coral Triangle, one of the most biologically diverse marine regions on our planet. It's home to 75% of coral species and 40% of the world's coral reef fish, such as damselfish, triggerfish, and my personal favorites, the wonderfully diverse butterfly fish. I've dived on lots of reefs, and this is up there with the best. Many marine areas have been hit by overfishing, but this reef, Siete Pecados, is now heavily protected to help the marine life and the local fishermen. This reef serves as a nursery ground where fish can grow, then can lay eggs, then that juvenile fish go outside. Then, of course, fishermen can catch. So people like me can enjoy the fish and the coral, and the fishermen elsewhere can make a living. Yeah, that is the win-win solution for now. While these cliffs are helping to support life, further north they use for a very different purpose. I'm traveling to the island of Luzon and to the village of Sagada. 280 kilometers north of Manila in the isolated highlands. I'm meeting up with my BBC colleague, Rico Hizon. I've always wanted to come to this place, but I've never had the chance. But look at these hanging coffins of Sagada. Absolutely wow. amazing. It is an Igorot uh, tribal tradition of, of burying their dead. And it's been going on now for, what, 500 years? It's eerie, but fascinating, don't you think? It's like a vertical churchyard. Yeah. This is the only location in the Philippines this practice takes place. We're meeting Sigrid Bangiai, a local villager and now tour guide from the Igorot community, who's keen to tell us why people are still buried on this cliff face. 
Here, the elders said that why plant your death in a land or in the um'a, in the field that you will be using in the future. Also, uh, their spirits still can roam around with the community. It's very notable, some of the coffins are, are short and stout and that's presumably the position the body was placed in the coffin. Yes, it's like going back where you came from. It's in a fetus, in a fetal position, in the womb. Many of the coffins look quite old. When was the most recent um, coffin placed on the cliff? Uh, this is the latest in 2010. 2010, very much a continuing practice, Rico. That's right, uh, Mike. And I'd also like to ask Sigrid, share with us the, about the burial process. When they do the burial, they wrap it in blanket, tie it together. The nearest skin of the, of the dead will be the first ones to carry, to carry the body. Everyone, everyone wants to be part of the procession because they believe that you know, when, because it's not embalmed and there's fluids coming off, it drips into your body. They believe that it's good luck. The coffin is then hoisted into position, often accompanied by a chair, which the dead body was placed on for up to four days before being put into the coffin, giving friends and family time to pay their respects. Sigrid, you are born and bred in this community. Would you like to end your days? <laughs> in a coffin halfway up a limestone cliff. I would like to. I won't be a tourist guide anymore. I will be a tourist spot. <laughs> <laughs> These hanging coffins of Sagada are a great example of the diverse culture and traditions in the Filipino community. You know, I, I, I grew up here in the Philippines and I've never been here before. Local traditions here are unlike anything I experienced on Palawan. And this variety of Filipino culture comes through in every walk of life, most noticeably in the cuisine. Rico wants me to try a home-cooked classic, adobo. Oh, rice yes, up. rice, the country's food staple. Thank you very much, Mike. Use my fingers. And Mike, this is... Adobo for you. You'll find it in menus all over the country and it is served in millions of homes. This is delicious. Mm. You know what's so special about this dish is that it varies from place to place. Each island and sometimes each town has their own special kind of adobo depending on the local and seasonal ingredients. It's delicious. <laughs> the, the sauce, the flavoring is fabulous. I can certainly taste salt very strongly and vinegar. Well, this dish originated when refrigeration was still not available. So they marinated it with vinegar and salt, and that is what preserved the meat. The dish is named after this marinating process. Adobo comes from the Spanish word adobar, meaning to marinate. This dish was concocted by the Spanish colonialists observing Filipino cooking methods. So it is a fusion of Spanish and Filipino cooking. So the Spanish have come over here and they've kind of influenced the, the Filipino food. Mm -hmm. Any other influences from around the world? Well, you know what? In the first century, you had the Chinese traders uh, bringing uh, spices uh, into the Philippines. And then, of course, the Spaniards ruled this country for more than 300 years and right after that the American influence of the fast food. That is why I love Filipino food so much because it is so rich and diverse. One of the most important Filipino ingredients is rice. So to see how it's grown, Rico and I have come to the Banawe rice terraces in northern Luzon. This is where heaven and earth come together. And these terraces are the stairways to heaven. <laughs> I love that thought. Just looking down, yeah. impressive feat of structural engineering. Uh, when were these constructed? Well, some suggest and the estimates are that they've been here for about 2,000 years. Really? And these Banawe rice terraces are frequently called the eighth wonder of the world. That really is a wonder. Um, looking down, the colors mm. are astonishing. Absolutely, and we'll have to give credit to the farmers who have 
grown these terraces over the generations. Feeding the nation. For every peso spent on food in the Philippines, 20 cents goes on rice, making it the nation's most important food crop. To see what it takes to work these terraces, Rico and I are meeting rice farmer Jimmy Kabigat. With the uh, four fingers, yeah. you put it uh, directly on the paddy surface, into the mud. Sowing these terraces is back-breaking work, and farmers are one of the poorest social groups in the country. Unsurprisingly, Younger generations are no longer keen to follow in their parents' muddy footsteps. You, Jimmy, you have six children. How many of them are farmers? And do they want to be farmers? Uh, that's the problem. The next generation that will inherit the rice terraces are no longer interested to, uh, cannot work uh, in the rice field because they prefer, if they are educated, then they prefer working in offices. Once again, perhaps tourism could be the solution by bringing in extra income and enticing the young workforce back to keep the terraces alive and secure their future. There's something beautiful about doing this work, though. Amazing location, very peaceful. It's a good, honest day's work. Have you done a good job, Jimmy? It's planted, but the distancing is somewhat uh, uh, not good. A mark out of 10? Oh, it might only be five. Oh, we've just passed. We've just passed, Mike. I've just passed? You've been talking. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing, full of admiration for the people who do this job. It is back-breaking work, physically demanding work, in the full sun. I will never look at a bowl of rice the same way again. <laughs> the terraces have been carved into these hills because of the rich volcanic soil that forms the foundation of this area. And all of those nutrients help create a landscape teeming with life. Where I'm heading next is one of the most remarkable sites for wildlife in the entire Philippines. The Sierra Madre Mountains National Park is considered the holy grail for those interested in nature because it's chock full of endemic species. Although it's only 160 kilometers east of the rice terraces, the drive takes over five hours on winding mountain roads. But it's well worth it because I've been given special permission to help conserve the rarest crocodile species in the world the Philippine crocodile. I'm going in. Tess Gatan Balbas and Bernard Tarun work for the Mabuwaya Foundation, a Filipino conservation group protecting and raising Philippine crocs. And I've offered to lend them a hand. I can't believe he's putting his hand in the water, searching for crocodiles that are almost a metre long. Oh, look at two! Quite a small one. Oh, I would love to have a hold. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Look at that. Wow. How old is this? I think this is more than one year old. OK. Yes, and then um, we will release this one tomorrow. Why are they starting their life here with you? Why not in the wild? Many of the young crocodiles are being predated by birds, by snakes, by ants, and by rats. That's why we are collecting them here. The survival rate here, if they are about 70 to 75 centimeters, is already very high because they can fight with other predators. By collecting eggs from the wild, Tess and her team can raise the hatchlings here and get them through the most dangerous part of their lives safely. I'm really excited to be spending a couple of days working for the team. It's so rare that I get to see what's known as a critically endangered animal. That's one that's in danger of extinction. Yes. Why has this declined so drastically? They are very rare because people hunt them and people kill them and their habitat are being converted into agricultural land. So how many mature Philippine crocodiles are there in the wild? In the Philippines, there are less than 250 mature individuals in the wild. 
As you'd expect with such an endangered species, everything has to be done just so. Before this young croc can be released, a few details need to be taken. So, time to check the sex. A little tiny hemipenis there, which means it's a boy. 815 grams, and that's 815 grams of attitude. <laughs> With all the measurements gathered, the young croc is carefully packaged up, ready for its new life in the wild. But getting to the release site is no easy task. It's deep into the interior, and the best way to get there is on the back of a truck. Recent rainfall makes the river crossings and roads all the more perilous. This is already the most remote place I've been to in the entire trip. We've still got one hour to go on this ridiculously amazing bumpy ride before we hit Virgin Forest and the place we're going to release the crocodiles. Thankfully, our precious cargo remains safely stowed, even as we winch ourselves along. Once the truck can take us no further, the rest must be done by boat and on foot. We're going to release our youngster in a well-protected area that already has a healthy population of crocodiles. What are the chances of this little fellow making it to a three-metre male? Well, in this place, the communities protect the crocodiles and they are conserving the crocodiles and the chances of their survival here is very, very high. So we hope to see him in the wild with his nest and the babies. We really have high hopes of that crocodiles will still survive and we can save them from the brink of extinction. I couldn't have put it better myself. The moment's come, it's been a very long journey for this little fella, almost planes, trains, automobiles to get here, but he's made it. It's time for liberation. Yes. Let's release the crocodile. Good luck, crocodile. Good luck. Here we go. His first moment of freedom. Wow, look at that. Wow. And off. Wow, look. Oh, so wow. at home there. That's <laughs> brilliant. On, well done. Oh, yeah. that's a magic moment. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations to you for all the hard work that you've done. There he is. He just sat there for a while, and then the whip of the tail, he'd gone. <laughs> By protecting both the Philippine crocodile and its habitat, the whole ecosystem benefits. To see how much life thrives here, Bernard, our crocodile expert, takes me out for one last treat before I leave the Philippines to do what I love doing most, bird watching. It's dawn and I'm right on the edge of a tropical rainforest. For me, this doesn't get any better. I think it's obvious I love my birds. I'm obsessed by ornithology. And there are so many species here I've never seen. I feel like a kid in a sweet shop. What I'm really keen to see are the endemic species. Birds found here and nowhere else in the world. And this area is full of them. We're getting wonderful views now of a bird called a coletto. It looks like a turbocharged blackbird, but it's got a red bare patch to a face and beautiful pale patches on its nape and wings. It's an endemic species to the Philippines, and it's a beauty. There are huge pressures on forests like this to be cut down, to make way for agriculture. But by protecting the Philippine crocodile, Bernard and his team are saving this habitat and the birds that live within it. 30% of all the birds listed for these islands are found here and nowhere else in the world. And that's because the Philippines have been evolutionarily isolated from the rest of Asia for hundreds of thousands, even millions of years. So birds have had the chance to evolve separately into different species, which is why it's a crying shame. If all this forest is lost, species will just disappear and there's nowhere else for them to live. 
In just a few hours, we come across 19 different bird species, 12 of which are endemic to the country. For me, it's a perfect end to the trip. From the instant I arrived in the Philippines, I have to say, it's totally got under my skin. I have loved it. It's been a great journey as well for me, Mike. I've experienced things that I've never done before in my country, from the hanging coffins to the Banawe rice terraces and the diversity of the culture and the traditions. That's what really excites me. I'm so mm. glad you mentioned diversity because I've seen reefs, I've seen rainforest, and that brings a huge variety of wildlife. <laughs> and let's not forget the amazing conservation projects that we've seen. The Philippine people are really trying to conserve what they have. And all of this confirms that my country is future-proof. And you know the best thing of all? We have visited just a handful of islands. There are thousands more to go for the next time, when, not if, I visit your amazing country.